This week is Banned Books Week, which started in 1982 to bring attention to book bans in the U.S. every year. So far this year, the American Library Association has recorded targeted censorship of at least 3,923 book titles in more than 200 schools and 200 public libraries. Our next guests are authors of two of the top five banned books. All of the challenge books on the list are claimed to be sexually explicit. George M. Johnson penned New York Times bestseller All Boys Aren't Blue, number two on the list, and Mike Carrado wrote Flamer, number four on the list. The award-winning authors join me now to discuss. So, George, your book is marketed as a young adult nonfiction memoir manifesto that follows your journey growing up queer and black, explicitly detailing sexual assault. And, Mike, your book is a graphic novel that is geared toward ages 14 and up, telling the story of a boy who's bullied for his appearance, highlighting dangerous stereotypes of being gay. These are queer-themed books, and they are two of the most banned books in schools and libraries. Some people, mostly parents, are concerned that they're inappropriate for children, shouldn't be in public libraries or classrooms. So, George, I'll start with you. Is that a fair argument? I would say it's not a fair argument. Uh, one, they oftentimes will say that these books are like for kids or that these books are like in elementary schools. That's just not the case. Uh, even if you go on Amazon and you look at my book, it says for 16 to 18 year olds. Um, it is for the more mature, younger adult. Uh, I think even more importantly, though, is we have to realize that these people, these, these young adults will be going out into the real world. So they need to be reading about these heavier topics that um, are already currently affecting them in their lives. I think people People think our books are introducing them to these heavier topics. They're already experiencing these things. All our books are doing is giving them the resources and teaching them how they will navigate those things um, throughout uh, their, their young adulthood as they go off to college and go off to becoming adults. Mike, what repercussions do you see from this type of censorship that's happening really at a broad level right now? Well, I'll tell you that, you know, when I was a teenager, um, I suffered from depression and suicidal ideation. And right now, the Trevor Project uh, has reported that 41% of um, queer teenagers um, contemplated suicide last year. So a book ban uh, in which lots of queer stories are being targeted, that sends a clear message to queer children that they're not wanted, that uh, we don't want you here. It's a form of erasure. I'm curious for both of you, do you hear from readers of these books? Do you hear stories and, and feedback and concern from readers about these, these um, banned books? Mike, you first. Um, I've gotten, you know, really great feedback from readers of all ages. Um, and I've also seen a lot of hateful comments too, but, um, you know, the stories that people have told me how they feel like validated, they feel like they've seen themselves for the first time in a book. Um, that's what keeps me going. And that's the reason why I made this book, because when I was a teenager, I did not see myself, um, in TV, in film, in books. Um, so I think that it's so important, uh, to represent um, you know, voices that aren't usually heard. George, talk a little bit about your your journey to get here and, and what you hear, you know, as your book is so high on this list of, of ones that are banned. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, while my book was super high on the list of being banned, it was also the number one book chosen by teen, teen readers through the American Library Association. So teens are telling the parents who are trying to ban the books that, no, we need these materials. The things that I get to hear are, I have seen young adults who have went in front of school boards and named their abusers and said it was because they read my book, that they even knew what abuse looked like. Um, I have gotten beautiful letters from teenagers who have changed their names, who have decided to uh, go on their identity journey um, and also be able to talk to their parents. But even more beautifully, I was able to sit with a group of senior citizens who were all above the age of 65. It was 33 of them who told me that this was the first time they had ever felt seen in a book. So the book has a universal effect where it helps grandmothers who are raising queer grandchildren. It helps therapists who have queer clients. So when you, know, when you start to ban our books, you are really erasing the story um, of these teens who really need to be reflected in the text because 
if they don't see themselves in books, sometimes they don't even know that they exist in the world. And I grew up the same way Mike grew up, without seeing any images of ourselves. And so we had no roadmap. Our books are now their blueprint. It's now their roadmap into society. What do you think then is a strategy to effectively fight these book bans, George? <laughs> well, as a person who uh, almost got into a fist fight in an airport with somebody who wanted to ban my book and happened to recognize my face, um, I'm going to advocate that fist fighting in an airport is not the way to do it. Um, even though, if that's what it came to, it would have been that's what it would have been. Uh, but honestly, I'm a part of a federal lawsuit in uh, Florida uh, where we um, one county tried to ban one woman from yeah. one county tried to ban 165 titles. Um, so I'm a part of a federal lawsuit. Uh, I sent my mother and my two aunts to Glenbridge, New Jersey, where they fought for my book at a school board meeting, and it went viral. And that encouraged other parents uh, to start to go to more school board meetings. I've sent videos into school board meetings so that I could give public testimony. Uh, I've also helped with uh, many of the uh, banned book clubs that are being formed by teenagers. Uh, I make sure that we supply them with books, but I also give them strategies on how they can do petitions and how they can use their voice and use their power uh, to strategize and organize to keep the books on the shelves. So I think we take a multi prong approach to it and I constantly work on that every day and and Mike what do you hope that readers take away from your books what do you hope that those watching take away when they hear you talking about it well I mean the whole point of writing a book like flamer is to give people hope I want you know kids to read that book and know they are normal they are loved there is a place for them in this world and I think that is you know the point of children's literature is to give the next generation the hope that they are going to grow up and live full lives and be loved. George M. Johnson and Mike Curato, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us and for uh, joining us for this conversation tonight. And if you are struggling with mental health distress, including thoughts of suicide, substance abuse, or emotional distress, text or dial 988. Free help is available 24-7. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.